Welcome back, everybody. Passage to Profit with Richard and Elizabeth Gerhardt. And we just had a really wonderful segment with Misty Wrigley Miller, uh, equestrian and entrepreneur. Thank you so much, uh, Misty. It was just really great hearing from you. And uh, we loved your advice. And for our next guest, we have Mr. Jack Killian, master networker. He's the founder of Street Smart Entrepreneurs and the Jack Killian Group and has been an entrepreneur, get this, for over 45 years. Still you think going he, strong. You would think he'd be tired of it by now, but not he's not. <laughs> <laughs> and he's grown multiple uh, diverse businesses and strategic businesses, and he's provided guidance to hundreds of entrepreneurs. A good friend of ours, welcome, Jack. Good to see you. And also a veteran. And also a veteran. Today is Veterans Today's, Day. We're taping this on Veterans Day. Yes, November 11th. 2020. Uh, 2020. So, so um, thank you, Jack, for your service to our country. Good. I, I would describe myself as a veteran veteran. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you to all veterans and all service people. So, yes, I agree. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mr. Veteran, um, tell us about what you're up to lately and uh, the types of things that entrepreneurs need help with. Over the last 45 years, I've started nine different companies, all of which made it to varying extents. And then I, I also purchased a financially uh, messed up family owned manufacturing company that I turned around and ran that for 13 years. <clears throat> and all those uh, experiences led me to start my latest new venture, which is called Street Smart Entrepreneurs. And when I look at COVID-19, I see all the terrible things that it's creating, but I think it's also going to create some major positive developments globally. And I think for sure it's going to boost entrepreneurship uh, globally. And I want to be part of that movement. I want to make my contributions into the entrepreneurial space. So I started Street Smart Entrepreneurs uh, about five or six months ago. And what we're currently doing is developing online and in-person courses for entrepreneurs, events for entrepreneurs. We're doing some strategic consulting, uh, both with entrepreneurs and with larger companies. Uh, down the road, I can envision even uh, creating a, uh, one or more incubators for entrepreneurs and possibly even an investment fund to uh, invest in some of the opportunities that we come across. And I'm in the process of uh, writing a book that summarizes the things I've learned uh, with all these various uh, ventures. And the working title of that book is called Been There, Done That, because I literally think that I've been there and I've done that. And I, I've... Uh, both for my own ventures and for other entrepreneurs that I've worked with. I, I've raised money for deals. I've bought companies, sold companies, merged companies, closed companies uh, that belong to uh, other entrepreneurs. Uh, I've started uh, new ventures in uh, venture capital. That was my first five year uh, new venture. That morphed into uh, starting a magazine. We started the first country music magazine in America. And Misty, you might be interested. We, we teamed up with the Minneapolis Star and Tribune Company. They became the investor in that new deal. And they hired uh, our three-man partnership to go in and try to turn around Harper's and help them sell it at the time. So I was involved in running Harper's. Uh, that was following my dad dropped dead. I had to uh, jump in and start running his company the day after he passed away. And when I got there, it had $23 in the bank, owed about $2 million, most of it personally guaranteed. So I had to take a company from that state and I ran it for 13 years. I never raised a dime of outside money. And I eventually sold it to a public British company went on their board and we did 10 high-tech high -tech acquisitions in three years and then sold that company. Then I uh, morphed into helping an ex-McKinsey friend of mine start a magazine in a wireless and mobile communication 
space. I stayed with that for about five years until we sold it. And that morphed into uh, me starting a, a technology focused hedge fund, which I was with for three years. I was one of the co founders. And I evolved that into starting a fund of funds that I ran for 18 years. And I sold, I closed that at the end of 18 when I ran into some health issues. And I just didn't feel comfortable managing money for other people while I was dealing with health issues of my own. Then I spent five years consulting and teaching people how to network and build alliances. So the first book I wrote was about networking. It's called Network All the Time, Everywhere with Everybody. So I've, I've coached uh, clients in places like Deloitte, J.P. Morgan Chase, Colgate, Palmolive, maybe a dozen universities. And if I had uh, a couple of key things to offer as advice to other entrepreneurs, it would certainly be to learn how to network and build relationships and create strategic alliances because that's where you're gonna learn, that's where you're gonna get new ideas, that's what, how you're gonna be able to leverage scarce resources that every entrepreneur deals with. So, uh, you know, I literally feel like I've been around the horn. I've lived and worked in France and in England, and I've taken some of these ventures globally pretty successfully. So, well, you know, I'm always available to help other entrepreneurs either think through how to start a business or how to turn around or fix a broken company or grow an emerging, you know, apparently successful company. When, when I talk to entrepreneurs, I tell them there are like seven or eight key factors for what I think are determining success. One of them is the entrepreneur's personal characteristics. Some people have the inherent characteristics and some people don't. The, the new business idea has to be valid and the business model has to be really sound and well thought through. And in most of the deals I've looked at, I probably looked at a thousand deals in my life. I, I have found very few where the idea was really compelling. You have to be able to fund your new idea. And too many entrepreneurs think only in terms of uh, selling equity or maybe taking on some debt. I think there's a lot more creative strategic ways to raise funding for deals. Uh, you have to be able to really identify your audience and have a cost-effective way of reaching your audience. And one of the issues that I'm wrestling with right now for street smart entrepreneurs is how do we really find the entrepreneurs that are going to be motivated to improve their, their abilities to grow a successful company? Uh, entrepreneurs need to have a competitive edge. And I see a lot of deals in a marketplace where they don't really have a strong, sharp competitive edge. And one thing I always talk to entrepreneurs about is you better be prepared to be your company's best salesman because that's a key component of being successful, uh, starting and growing new ventures. Uh, the top person always has to be capable of being an exceptional salesperson. You can't simply outsource that. And then, as I said, you got to be really strong at networking and de developing strategic alliances. And I think uh, COVID has made that even easier by spurring the use of uh, Zoom so we can create alliances around the world. And I'm certainly doing that for street smart entrepreneurs. I, I think you start with uh, having a passion and a vision for being prepared to step off the ledge. My, the early part of my career was pretty traditional. I went to really great colleges. I went to Yale, MIT, and Harvard. Then I had a very good job in England with a British tech company. Then I came back to the States and I was with McKinsey, which is certainly a good place to be. But it wasn't what I really felt in my heart I wanted to do. So at the time, uh, one of the partners at McKinsey started talking about nominating me as a partner. That made me sort of think about what I want to do. And that same night, I, I was working late and I called my wife up and I said, I just made two decisions. And she said, what are they? 
I said, we're going to buy a racehorse. And she said, what are we going to do that? I said, God only knows because we don't have any money. So we'll have to find an inexpensive racehorse. And she said, what else did you decide? I said, I'm going to quit my job. And she said, what are you going to do then? I said, tomorrow. <laughs> and she said, why? And I explained why. I, I said, you know, I just don't want to, you know, lead the partners at McKinsey down a path that I'm really going to be interested in being a partner. So if I'm not going to do that, I might as well try to find what I want to do. I have a passion for small businesses. I've written my thesis at MIT about working with small companies. So I said, I'm going to leave and try to start a company to work with other entrepreneurs to raise funding for their deals. And it took me about three or four months to exit McKinsey, but that's what I did. And when I left, I had no partners, no real money, no business cards, no office, no experience doing what I wanted to do, and no network of people to work with. So I was really starting cold turkey. Uh, but that's where I really started to learn the importance of meeting people, building alliances, looking for ways to give back to people. And that's really where I got my PhD in entrepreneurship, looking at a thousand deals, you know, 98% of them, which were not very interesting. The most interesting one that we got involved in was helping launch Rolling Stone magazine. So we, we saw that as a pretty compelling business case. Uh, I had consulted with uh, Columbia Records and Clive Davis. So I had a little bit of background. My partner was from Texas and is a country music fan. So we decided to go raise money to start Country Music Magazine. And that, uh, that publication ran for over 30 years. Wow. So I think you have to have a passion and, and you have to be, yeah, and the key thing is you have to have support at home. You know, you can't be out trying to be an entrepreneur when you're struggling to have that kind of support at home because it's high risk, often low reward, frequent, a lot of tension. It takes a major commitment that impacts a family. And, and I think, too, uh, one thing entrepreneurs need to pay attention to is their own personal fitness and health if they try to do this because you, you can't do these entrepreneurial things in a half-hearted way. And they, it, it really creates a drain on, on you physically and emotionally, and you have to be prepared to deal with that. Wow. So every, every venture I've started, I've had a passion or a real interest in that area. I went to the racetrack as a kid with my dad and developed an interest in horse racing. And back in the early days, when I decided to get into that business, you know, there was no more, no one in the country more passionate about horse racing than me. And it wasn't the gambling aspect of it. It was the competitiveness, the pageantry, and the horses themselves. And, you know, I used to, I used to get up every morning for 20 years at 4 o'clock so I could be at the racetrack by 6 and back in my office in New York by 9. Excellent. And I loved every minute of it. What are some mistakes that entrepreneurs make when starting off in business, would you say? Uh, oh, there's a lot of them. One of which is thinking an idea for a product is the same as an idea for a company. I've had a lot of people approach me with a product that might be viable, but it's certainly not the basis for starting a company. I've, I've seen a lot of entrepreneurs start a business and be reluctant or unwilling to be the out front salesperson. Uh, I've seen a lot of new ventures where maybe the business idea was okay, but the business model itself was not right. And I, I've been into some turnaround situations. My dad's company and a company I ran for this British tech company where they had a good business idea, but the way they were doing it wasn't right. And once we changed the business model, things really began to grow. And I think now you have to be thinking globally and you have to be thinking about providing great customer service. I think customer service too often is uh, underestimated by entrepreneurs and it can be a real source of competitive strength. So I, I see a lot of things. So Jack, we're coming to the end of the segment now and uh, we really enjoyed listening to you and your story. 
and the, the nuggets of wisdom. I can see why you would title your book, Been There, Done That, because you have been there and you have done that. Right. And it's always a great pleasure uh, to meet with you and to speak with you. And uh, thank you very much. And Thanks for the opportunity. It's great. We'll be back right after this commercial announcement. This is Passage to Profit with Richard and Elizabeth Gerhardt. Mm-hmm.